Thank you very much, Marcus. And thanks once again to Hazel for that rich and very engaged discussion. And uh, we now want to move on. I also want to thank all the persons who contributed, who asked questions, who discussed in the chat. And I hope that we are able to save the chat because there's a lot for us to reflect on based on the questions there. So thanks everyone. So now we are coming to the end and I now ask Dr. Gabriel Hussain, head of the Institute for Gender and Development Studies, St. Augustine, to bring us closing remarks and notes on the way forward 2021. Gabriel Hussain. Good evening, everyone. Um, I'd like to start just by thanking everyone who came to this. From the numbers that we have here, we know that there is the possibility to expand the community of people who are committed to ending um, child sexual abuse and incest. Uh, I'd like to say that uh, in the context of the Break the Silence Network, which for more than a decade, we have been continuing to encourage and hope to see grow. But this is a real way um, that the network can expand its work wherever it is any of you are. The Break the Silence uh, campaign, which has been the only national campaign in Trinidad and Tobago of its kind to raise awareness at the level of advocacy, less so at the level of service provision. There are so many excellent organizations. Mary Moonan is here representing them, um, Rape Crisis Society, and so many more. But at the level of advocacy, we need far more voices than the Break the Silence campaign. And even uh, others such as Create Future Good that are speaking out publicly, taking up public space, um, insisting on being heard, not just by citizens, but by policymakers and by politicians, so that there is an idea out there that not only are we attempting to change social norms, but that social norms are changing and that legislation, services, provision of services, provision of psychological services, schools and more, all need to be able to get on board at this level. So for all of you that are here as part of this, just to say to you that the network is a living, um, you know, it's a living entity. It's not created by any one person in particular. So if any of you feel inspired enough by Dr. Debreu's um, you know, call to action, to want to then take action and bring that to the network. That is absolutely something that we would welcome in the most democratic form, in the most popular form, in the most led from anywhere in the country or the region form um, that, we can, that we can enable and encourage. So please know that the network is available for all of you to join to bring your ideas, to bring your energy, and to bring your leadership. Just let us know how you would like to do that. Uh, speaking for myself as head of the Institute, I, I, I just want to say how both humbled and horrified I am and continue to be. The question of sexual violence in, in Trinidad and Tobago and in the region is entirely under addressed. So when we think about, we've now, when we think about violence against women and girls, we have come to terms in the public discourse which such things as domestic violence or intimate partner violence or physical violence, but sexual violence at all levels of women's lives, at all levels of any of our lives is, is silenced in many ways in the public discourse. And we do not think about the violence that goes on in the home in terms of sexual violence from birth to death for so many people. And this really signals the extent to which we need to, to you know, do much better 
in putting sexual violence on the radar, whether it's the 58% of girls in Latin America that report being sexually abused, or the one in five women that report being sexually abused as the prevalent survey in Trinidad and Tobago reported these numbers are ones that we need to, um, that report being abused by non-partner sexual violence in Trinidad and Tobago. These numbers are ones that we clearly need to pay more attention to. Sexual violence in general, child sexual abuse in particular, and this topic of under five child sexual abuse, which I must say in all of our work, we have just never highlighted and emphasized in the way that we are being called on to do so now. And I wanna say, Dr. Debreu, how, as you know, I take this very seriously. The IGDS is prepared to support you however it is we can, but I feel, I feel a, a huge sense of responsibility in the next decade of the Break the Silence campaign that we take this on in a way that we, we need to far more than we ever have. And that's a commitment I'm making to you now and which you will see happen um, as we go along. Some things that stood out to me, the idea that somebody always knew, that is such a powerful line. It is such a powerful line to bring to whoever it is we are doing this kind of public education with and this conversation with, because that is such a fact and it is such an entry point and it is the entry point to the bystander model. Um, I'm interested to learn more from your project as I'm sure we all are. It seems that there's so many psychological implications and complexities, knowing as a child, knowing as an adult, knowing as a sibling, knowing as a parent, knowing as a neighbor, each of them are, are, are a psychologically different position. And, and, and I think the psychologists have so much to offer us um, in this field as well. Um, in relation to the bystander approach, that's something that's been, been growing in the public discourse around many things, masculinities and so on. And so I feel like, you know, bringing that into this conversation of preventing child sexual abuse at this point is timely and necessary. And there's a bed of it being promoted as a strategy in relation to a number of areas of violence that allow us to connect this kind of sh notion of shared responsibility much more than we may have again um, in the future. This has revitalized my own, you know, very often we think, okay, service provision is where the real work is. And of course that's true. Sometimes we think legislation and of course that's true, but this has revitalized my understanding and commitment to social norm change, which is so much harder, so much less tangible. It seems so, um, you know, difficult to measure. Um, and yet at the same time, we come back to it again and again and again. And it's renewed my commitment to that um, in the course of the Break the Silence campaign. I was struck in many ways by your, um, your negotiation of a of a approach that is restorative and and how challenging and difficult and um, and complicated that is but yet your concern that as long as we take a a heavy and even criminalized approach, and of course we need to in the context of crimes against children, but that what I'm hearing you say is that we need to break the silences, right? That allow victims in the first place to speak out about their experiences and to have those experiences be heard. And that in trying to encourage victims to speak out and break those silences, restorative justice, uh, justice approaches, which are not the end point, but which are part of the process of enabling that uh, um, can provide one of many directions. And I hear you saying, I will take as many directions as I can because there are too many children that are still experiencing this and, and whatever is gonna work, I'm gonna make it work. To, to do that break the silence work. And, and I hear that and I'm, and I'm really interested in learning much more about it. And if we can support from the, where I speak at the IGDS in terms of toolkits, social media campaigns, public conversations, 
continued public education, engaging with service providers however we can. You have an ally with us at the University of the West Indies. Um, we really admire the work of Sweetwater Foundation. Um, we admire the research that has been produced by yourself and others like Professor Adele Jones. We rely on that research in the region. We always rely on the research in the region to help us in our advocacy and in our partnerships. And so we are looking forward to seeing this research that you're beginning um, to grow. And we're looking forward to seeing it be published because we will use it um, in, in our advocacy. Three things, four things stood out to me uh, as I close. And, and you know, you've left us with so much to think about. The first is the way that vulnerability is so closely linked to violence, whether that is the vulnerability of boys or girls as children, whether it is boys uh, great silence that may hide their numbers or girl silence, the different gender dynamics at play. It is a fact that we, are, we need to do greater work to highlight children's and preschool age children's infant vulnerability far more than we need to start putting that out there so that we understand that children are vulnerable and, and we use, I'm hearing such key messages come out of what you're saying that, that I feel may characterize some of our work in the future, that intersection between vulnerability and violence. We continue to treat the home as if it is in the most nostalgic way that feminists have been critiquing for decades, as if it is a safe place. And we have to do so much more work to highlight to people that the home becomes violated, the second children become violated. And if we have to, to mobilize people around that nostalgia associated with the home, if you're gonna characterize it this way, feel this nostalgia, then it must be truthful. It must be real. It must be a shared experience. So I'm already beginning to think about the ways you've inspired us to change our discourse and to engage in, um, in a public conversation. I see a place here for the youth movement. I see a place here for young feminism. I see a place here for all of those in secondary schools that, um, you know, and in primary schools where there is an HFLE curriculum, a health and family life education curriculum, where issues of gender-based violence are introduced to know if nothing else, that when children speak up on behalf of other children, with other children, to other children, that that pair culture can actually change the norms that appear to be so resilient. And, um, and finally, I would just, I would like to say that we are, um, we spent more than 10 years in this Break the Silence campaign. I really see us taking this call that you've given to us and strengthening it over the next 10 years. And I'm happy for anyone who is on this, in this session, for us to come together and think about what our strategy can be, what a shared partnership can look like, how the network can grow, how we can support the service providers out there who we know are underfunded and trying their best with the resources that we do have, and how we can continue to focus on prevention as much as we can. So Professor Rhoda Redock, Marcus Kassoon, Amanda Chu, Professor Adele Jones, Jonathan Bagan, Mary Moonan, Priya Maharaj, our key speaker, Dr. Dabrio, I want to thank you so much for this, for all that you've given us, and, and to recognize that you've also handed us a responsibility during this time of COVID-19 to recognize that the effects are not just today, but will last longer than COVID-19 and, and that we continue to remember that even when things may apparently go back to normal next year or the year after, that the experiences that would have been had at this time will still leave traumas that need to be healed. 
I would especially on behalf of the Institute for Gender and Development Studies like to thank Ms. Catherine Chan, who has been an absolute powerhouse of the Break the Silence Network in so many ways and who is an activist in her own right that is often not credited or given visibility and without whom we would never have had this forum today in all the ways that we did and to credit all of you behind the scenes that are doing the work and to just say let us use this evening to replenish our sense of urgency and, and to work together in whatever ways that we can to protect children and to empower them. So I thank you all. Thank you very much, Tab, for that really, uh, you, know, you know, it was such a deep reflection on what we've experienced today. Uh, I really wanted to say that in terms of the way forward, the IGDS has been involved in producing a Spanish language toolkit for work with migrant workers, sorry, migrant children, many of whom are here from Venezuela, but also from other parts of the region. And some years ago, uh, supported by Tisha Nikonik, we had produced a toolkit for use in Trinidad and Tobago. So the migrant, the Spanish language toolkit, which is currently being produced, we hope to launch it next April because we normally celebrate Child Abuse Awareness Month in April. And therefore you should be hearing more from us on that. And this toolkit will be relevant to Guyana and to Trinidad and Tobago. So I think this is a really new and exciting area in which we will be taking the Break the Silence campaign. So I'd like to really thank Dr. Deborah McPhee and all the other staff who have been involved in the production of this toolkit. So if there's nothing else, I'd really like to thank everyone and to uh, thank again our guest speaker and we're seeing in the chat how much appreciation is coming forward. But this has been a long event. I think it has been a good event, but we need to bring it to an end. So thanks everyone. See you next year or in April. Thank you very much. Thank you everyone. Bye. Thank you, Hazel. We'll be You're welcome. Soon.